Hello and welcome back. We are continuing with our apologetic series on the YouTube behind the camera. Thank goodness is our seminarian Peter before he goes back to seminary. So I forced him to sit here and uh, listen to me actually as he does other things. So it's not really a big deal. But why don't we begin today? We're going to be talking about the canon of scripture, what belongs in the Bible and what doesn't. But let us begin as we do all things in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pope St. Innocent I, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peter is a little slow in that response to the prayer. He's still working on these things. All right. So I've talked about the history of the Bible before uh, in a homily. Um, I think that was one of the more popular uh, homilies because it's interesting. Where exactly did we get the Bible? Uh, and very few people know it. Very few Catholics and even fewer Protestants know that. Um, and it's, um, I think, one of the most important things when speaking with non-Catholic Christians. I mean, uh, uh, atheists aren't going to care where we get the Bible from. Um, I suppose you could talk a little bit with the Jews about the Old Testament, but this conversation is more with non-Catholic Christians. And um, again, uh, right up front, it's not that we have any type of disrespect or looking down uh, upon others. Uh, it's you know, everything is, of course, done in charity um, and, and friendship. Uh, but it's also important to hold on to the truth. Uh, as you'll notice, uh, we have different books in our Bible and both can't be true. We believe in objective truth, two plus two equals four, uh, and we believe in the principle of non-contradiction. Uh, so it is important to have respect for persons, but also have respect for the truth. And so that's why it's worth talking about these things. Um, okay, and so just personally, when I get approached, like in an airport or wherever, uh, by a, a zealous non-Catholic Christian who wants to convert me, even though I'm wearing something like this, uh, Again, usually Catholics are on the defensive, but there's no need to be on the defensive. And as soon as you get comfortable with um, being able to explain the faith, uh, you can be on the offensive. And so at a certain point, I got comfortable enough. And so I usually try to go on the offensive right off the bat. Uh, not that I'm not willing to answer their questions, but in order to have a dialogue with somebody, you have to establish a common ground. What is the common ground uh, where you can have a fruitful dialogue? If there's no common ground, there's no need for discussion. I mean, Osama bin Laden probably didn't have common ground with rational, uh, nonviolent people. Uh, so you, can't, you couldn't have a conversation with him. Uh, so clearly, uh, Christians should be able to dialogue about the Bible. Or so you think that we all share the Bible uh, and belief in Jesus. Well, we have to uh, set out our parameters, I think, more clearly about the Bible. Well, what's in the Bible? And, uh, and how did we get the Bible? And just these sorts of questions, before we jump into other theological topics, I've found that to be uh, very helpful. And it's, uh, it can be a very, very powerful conversation for a non-Catholic Christian because they're left um, not being able to answer a number of these questions. So I'll usually ask a non-Catholic Christian, where do we get the Bible from? Uh, why do we believe in 27 books of the New Testament, not 28 or 26? Why these 27? Uh, did they, uh, how did we learn that they're divinely inspired, etc. And so clearly this will lead to a conversation about the authority of the church. Everything comes down to uh, authority, church authority. Um, and you have, you're forced at the end of the day to admit that the Catholic Church has uh, divine authority, and it's by that divine authority that we're able to know what's in the Bible. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have different books in our, not different books, we have different number of books in our Bibles. Catholics have 73 books in their Bible. Uh, Protestants, virtually all of them, have only 66 books. They have seven fewer books in the Old Testament. The books in dispute are called the Deuterocanonical books, or as they call it, the Apocryphal books. Okay, so you're talking about First and Second Maccabees, Wisdom, uh, Baruch, Judith, uh, Tobit, uh, and Sirach. So those are your seven books. They do not have them in their Bible. They do not believe them to be divinely inspired. And so the origin of this uh, is that at the time of the Lord, uh, what belonged in 
the Bible in the Old Testament wasn't as clearly defined. You had two main uh, Bibles floating around. You had a, a Hebrew version and you had a Greek version. All right, what's the story of that? What's the story of the Greek version? Between two and 300 years before Christ, um, Ptolemy II in Egypt commissioned, it was either 70 or 72 rabbis to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. Why? Because Jews are spread all across the Mediterranean. Uh, they're probably more often Greek reading than Hebrew, uh, and you just get a broader audience, and who knows what his other reasons were, but that happened. And so that's what you call the uh, um, Septuagint, which means a 70 uh, in, in Latin. And so you're talking about the 70, or it could have been 72 scholars who did that translating. Okay, now, most of the time, the Greek version had those seven books of the Bible. And most of the time, the Hebrew version did not have those seven books. That's just a general statement. It's not absolute. It wasn't in every case, but just that was sort of, um, uh, that was the impression that was given that in general, the Greek had the seven books. In general, the Hebrew did not. That's going to come back up later. All right. Now, let's talk about the New Testament real quick. In what language the, was the New Testament uh, written? Rush, what language? New Testament. Greek. Greek. That's right. Any exceptions to that? Maybe Matthew, maybe Matthew in Aramaic, but it got translated into Greek, and that's the canonical uh, version. And so, uh, Peter, do you know how often the New Testament writers would quote the Greek Old Testament as opposed to the Hebrew? Always. It, close. Yeah, you're saying always close. So, of the, um, what's the total number? Well, we'll put it this way. In 340 places in the New Testament, the New Testament author is using the Greek version of the Old Testament. And only 33 times uh, are they using the Hebrew. So over 90% of the time, uh, the New Testament authors are using the Greek. And here's an example that is really, really important. Um, Isaiah 7. Uh, you hear this around Christmas time when it says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Um, in the Hebrew, it just says young woman. And okay, a young woman will conceive and bear a son. Not that big of a miracle. That tends to happen each day. Uh, but the Greek version narrows the definition to virgin. Is a virgin a young woman? Uh, usually, yes. But it's explicitly a virgin. A virgin. And so that's what, uh, like, for instance, you know, Matthew... Um, I think it's Matthew. It could have been Luke. I think it's Matthew, uh, who is talking about Isaiah um, and using Isaiah as proof that Joseph was not the natural father of our Lord. Uh, Christ is the Son of God. And by the way, look at this prophecy in the Old Testament: a virgin shall conceive. That's an example of where why the Greek is so important. People think Jews would prefer Hebrew or whatever. Well, New Testament authors are using the Greek. And that's a, a prime example. Okay, so uh, there were two kind of versions floating around. It wasn't exactly a settled issue at the time of the Lord. And um, however, the uh, early church always considered those seven books uh, divinely inspired. In fact, this is a non-issue basically forever. Uh, the early church was using the Greek version of scripture overwhelmingly, and they uh, at no point were they in much dispute. In fact, to give you an example, uh, Peter, do you know the other name for Sirach? Ecclesiasticus? Exactly. Ecclesiasticus, as opposed to Ecclesiastes. Those are two separate books. Ecclesiasticus means the church book, essentially. It's an adjective, the church one, the ecclesiastical one. The reason why Sirach, one of these seven that the Protestants don't have, was called Ecclesiasticus was because of the frequency with which the early church used it. That's how often the people who were formed by the apostles or who were formed by those who were formed by the apostles, like the early church, very important time, they used Sirach all the time. I think, in fact, it was second only behind the book of Psalms. So the early church um, overwhelmingly, it was a complete non-issue. They absolutely used those seven books. All right. Um, you did have St. Jerome who questioned 
the, you know, why can't we see those in, in Hebrew? Um, and Martin Luther later is going to use Jerome uh, against the Catholic Church. But let's, even though Jerome had questions about the seven books, like where's the Hebrew, it's not like he rejected them. He believed in the authority of the church. In fact, he was commissioned by the Pope, Pope, uh, Pope Damasus, in, uh, to translate scripture into the Vulgate. So um, even if he had questions, he submitted to the authority of the church because everybody did, because that's how the early church was structured. All right. So uh, these seven books were a complete non-issue uh, until the 16th century. And then that's when Martin Luther... The person who supposedly, you know, is credited for saving scripture from the evil Catholic Church that would like chain the Bible and keep it from people. Um, you know, the reason why you would chain a Bible, I think that was a good idea, especially before the printing press, was because you know how expensive, Peter, one of those was to make a full Bible before the printing press. I don't know exactly. It's a lot. It was a lot, yeah. Yeah, and how many little sheep had to had to die? in order to give <laughs> give their skin <laughs> to be used for a Bible. It was a lot. So yeah, good luck putting a really expensive handwritten uh, you know, Bible out for anybody to steal and sell somewhere else. Um, no, no, no. So there, uh, Martin Luther came after the printing press, and that's a very important uh, historical thing to remember. All right, so Martin Luther... He said, all right, we need to drop those seven books. Why? Because they weren't in Hebrew at the time of Christ. All right. Okay. A question to be asked there is, well, two questions. Number one, Martin Luther, what authority do you have to throw out books of the Bible? I don't presume to have authority to throw out books of the Bible. Why did you have presumed authority to throw out books of the Bible? You know, the, the man who created that uh, phrase, Sola Scriptura, you know, Bible alone has authority. You're throwing out authoritative books. All right, so that's a problem, number one. Number two, all right, you have a criterion. Uh, they're not in Hebrew at the time of Christ. Who cares? Who cares? What makes that criterion uh, divinely inspired itself or infallible? It could have been written in Swahili. Why, you know, so it doesn't make, uh, we can't, uh, we can't just assume that that's a legitimate criterion. Uh, so, and you know what else was interesting, very interesting. If the major argument is that they weren't in Hebrew at the time of our Lord, uh, you know what they found, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, which was the greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century in the 1940s, uh, you found scripture as old as Christ and a little bit older. Peter, you know what you, they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls? The Pentateuch, right? Well, they found all sorts of stuff, but on this issue, they found uh, several books of the uh, Deuterocanonical books, Tobit and Sirach, I think. You found several of these books in Hebrew at the time of Christ completely disputing uh, what Martin Luther's objection was. So if that was his objection for throwing out seven books of the Old Testament, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls disproves uh, his assumption. So that's where archaeology comes in to save, uh, to save the day here. Um, but let's be clear, Martin Luther didn't like those seven books because 2 Maccabees 12 was, was explicitly in favor of praying for the dead. And Martin Luther had, uh, had planted his flag uh, against praying for the dead. He rejected purgatory. That's a whole other issue we'll talk about later. Um, but uh, 2 Maccabees 12 uh, says that it's a good and just thing to pray for the dead. Um, okay. You should also know that Martin Luther also wanted to throw out uh, other books, including New Testament books. Uh, James and Revelation, uh, for example. He called the epistle of James the epistle of straw, um, which that doesn't seem too respectful, because James goes for paragraphs on how a man is not justified by faith alone. You're not made right before God by faith alone. It's faith and works. James explicitly writes. And Martin Luther was going around saying you're justified by faith alone but you have a book of the Bible explicitly condemning that idea. 
Uh, so he wanted to throw out James. He called it an epistle straw, and he said, Revelation ought to reveal something. Uh, but his followers said, you may not want to be throwing out books of the New Testament. The Old Testament, maybe you can get away with. New Testament, that's a little bit harder to swallow. He also added the word alone to uh, Romans 3, verse 28, when Paul says, man is justified by faith. Okay, and not works of the law, not works in general, works of the law, circumcision, okay, uh, the observances of the Jews. Uh, Martin Luther added the word alone uh, to man is justified by faith alone. Um, I don't think we ought to be adding or subtracting words or subtracting entire books, for that matter, of the Bible. All right. So the New Testament, uh, we agree on in terms of there are 27 books in the New Testament. Catholics and Protestants have... Uh, the same books. Now, how did we get the Bible? Um, when did this discussion begin? Uh, you started having bishops as early as the, the second century putting together a list, uh, but these are just individual bishops. Uh, so Bishop of Sardis, uh, Mileto, around 175, gave a list. Um, St. Irenaeus in 185, he's in France, he gave a list. Um, but to what extent these things were authoritative, it was probably just more their opinion as they're guiding their flocks. Uh, Eusebius uh, at 325, he gives a list. But really, the issue of Scripture doesn't become a large issue until the late 300s. Um, think about it. Christianity is illegal the first 300 years of um, after Christ. And then uh, Con Constantine uh, is made emperor. He legalizes it. Eventually, it's made the official Roman religion. And so, in 313, Christianity is legalized. Um, and, Peter, what was the first ecumenical council after that? After? Uh, the legalization of Christianity in 313. 325 Nicaea. 325 Nicaea. And what was the chief issue at Nicaea? Was it the Bible? No, it was the divinity of Christ. It was the divinity of Christ. Um, so, think about that. The first, all right, Christianity is legalized. They're able to come out of the catacombs. They're able to speak very freely, uh, and the bishops gather together. And but the issue at hand is not the Bible, because that wasn't the emphasis of the early church. Not that the early church didn't revere the Word of God; it certainly did. But the emphasis was on the lived experience as a Christian, living together as a church under a, a, an apostle or one of their successors. You know, mass literacy is a non-issue for until the, the 19th century. And so the idea of emphasizing you have your Bible and you read it is completely foreign uh, to Christianity. Um, you know, because you don't have the printing press, you don't have mass literacy. So the emphasis will have to be elsewhere. Now, was the Bible read and appreciated and absorbed? Yes, but that was done in the middle of mass. And we're going to notice how that is um, one of the criteriums that the church uses uh, to determine what belongs in Scripture. All right. So the first issue is not even the Bible. It's the divinity of Christ, which is obviously hugely important. But we do eventually start getting into the issue. All right. Well, what exactly is divinely inspired? There were questions. For the most part, I think people agreed on things. Um, you'll notice that it wasn't the Old Testament that was getting debated. It was more so what belonged in the New Testament. Um, was the book of Revelation, for instance, divinely inspired? I mean, it's, you know, a little out there, <laughs> you know, to be perfectly honest. It's a completely different genre of literature, etc. Um, Second Peter was disputed. Hebrews was disputed. Jude was disputed. Um, and what's more, why were other books not included? You had Pope Clement, uh, who is a first century pope. He's there in the 90s. He's even mentioned uh, by Paul in one of his letters. Uh, and he wrote a letter. He's the Bishop of Rome. Uh, John the Apostle is still alive. Uh, why is his letter not divinely inspired? Um, so these things were being uh, debated. And so uh, Pope Damasus in 382, uh, prompted by a council in Rome, a local council, I think, in Rome, wrote a decree listing the 73 books that we have today. Right? And then in North Africa, which used to be very, very Christian until um, the Muslim conquest uh, of it, in 393, the Council of Hippo, uh, where Augustine was, presumably he's still reigning as bishop at this point, 
uh, they give a list of uh, the 73 books that we have today. The Council of Carthage also in 397, that uh, gives a list. And I actually printed out, this is from the uh, Codex Africanus, um, or Codex um, Canonum Ecclesia Africanae, uh, in which it gives the actual list. So here is from the council in Carthage in the late 390s, okay? It's giving a list of, um, of what belongs in the Bible, and there's your, your English over there. And you know what's really interesting, though, is that it's the line down, down here. Okay. Ita ut de confirmando isto canone transmarina ecclesia consultator. What does that mean? All right, so they gave the list of books, and it essentially means let the transmarina, the, the church across the sea, be consulted in order to confirm this canon. So that's an indication that the churches in the early church understood the church of Rome, the church across the sea from Carthage is Rome. Rome had the final say, it was the final arbiter of uh, things in the church. Everybody knew that, okay? So uh, this, is where, this is where you get your Bible from, Council of Carthage, and then it's confirmation by uh, the Pope, Pope St. Innocent I, whose prayers we solicited at the beginning of this episode, um, in 405, he approved these 73 books and he closed the canon. It became a non-issue. He's like, all right, no more discussion. This is it. These are the, the, the divinely inspired books. Okay. Now think about that. If we didn't have the authority of the Pope, the authority of the bishops, the authority of the church, how else would we know what belongs in the Bible? You take a vote, 51%. Uh, what if there's a disagreement? There was. How do you settle this? You know, and this is why uh, when you get rid of the authority of the church, which is what happened within Protestantism, uh, sola scriptura, the Bible alone has authority. No, no bishop, no pope, no nothing. They don't have authority. Only the Bible has authority. Okay, fine. That sounds like a nice idea when you do that. And there's a disagreement. There's no judge to adjudicate the matter. What happens? You split. You split. Peter, how many Protestant denominations are there, do you think? You told me recently. It's in the hundreds. It's more than that. Oh, thousands? What, tens of thousands, my man. I mean, you got your main ones, obviously, that are larger, but it's in the tens of thousands. Every time there's a disagreement, you fire the, 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 uh, the organist or you get the wrong color carpet, or something, you know, there can be a disagreement and a split, or something more theologically uh, important. All right, so we're noticing we're coming closer and closer to the authority of the church and why it's so important. Uh, Luther had to admit this. Um, he said, quote, We concede, as we must, that so much of what they, Catholics, say is true, that the papacy has God's word and the office of the apostles and that we have received Holy Scripture, baptism, the sacrament, and the pulpit from them. What would we know of these if it were not from them? All right, and that's from Luther's works, volume 24, I guess page 304. All right, so without the church, we would not know what uh, books are divinely inspired course, didn't stop him from throwing out seven books of the, the Old Testament. And please never let um, somebody say that the Catholic Church added the seven books of the Old Testament, like at the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent, which was later in the 1500s, which was in response to Martin Luther and the Protestant uh, Reformation, uh, it dealt with the canon of Scripture. But just because it's dealing with the canon of Scripture and reaffirming that these are the 73 books, it's not what didn't happen was they weren't saying for the very first time, these are the 73 books, including the, these seven. They didn't like tack the, the seven on there 1500 years after Christ. Uh, we've always believed in those books. Okay. So just because a council uh, asserts something doesn't mean the church didn't believe it beforehand. With the Council of Nicaea said that Christ is fully divine, 
it wasn't like the church began believing in in 325 at the Council of Nicaea. It's not like that's when that idea first popped into the head of the church. The church had always believed in the divinity of Christ, and the church has always believed in the inspiration of the seven disputed books. St. Augustine said, quote, I would put no faith in the Gospels unless the authority of the Catholic Church directed me to do so, end quote. I mean, think about it. What did Christ say? Write this in remembrance of me? No, he said, do this. He gave commands. I mean, Christ himself didn't write anything that lasted. He wrote in the sand uh, when they were uh, uh, to stone the uh, the woman. But um, his great commission wasn't go uh, write 27 books really quickly and invent the printing press and teach mass literacy and, have, and give everybody their Bible and teach them to read it and to come up with their own conclusions. No, that's not how the early church functioned at all. Okay. Um, I think there's also another important point when it comes to um, the early church is the fact that all of them believed the same thing. Uh, all the churches, including the, you think by the, ap the end of the apostolic age, by the end of the first century, the church had spread across a good chunk of the world. Um, as far west as um, probably France. And I mean, Paul talked about wanting to go to Spain, um, but definitely like, for instance, in Italy, but also uh, Greece, Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, uh, Syria, Palestine, uh, Egypt, um, and then as far east as India. Um, and that's not it. Uh, Armenia as well. Uh, and so all these churches believe the same thing and believe them from the beginning who is anybody a thousand and five hundred years later, who are they to say that they were wrong? Those churches were founded by apostles. Why are they wrong? Um, the burden of proof really ought to be on somebody who wants to throw out books of the Bible, books that were never in dispute, um, of any substantial dispute in church history. All right. Uh, what else? And also think, you know, think about it in terms of cause and effect, how can, because if you talk to a non-Catholic Christian, they are forced to admit, all right, this is historically how the Bible came together. And I even had one very, very bright, um, you know, evangelical, you know, tell me when I was explaining to him about these councils, uh, they're the ones who uh, came up with the list, etc. cetera. Uh, he said, um, well, clearly the Holy Spirit must have inspired them. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of the idea. <laughs> that's what we believe. Uh, because they don't know how to, um, they don't know how to put together the Bible otherwise. Um, the Bible does not glow in the dark. You know, those particular seven, 73 books or those seven books of the Old Testament. It's not like, you know, you can put them under a microscope and they, they look different. Uh, they didn't, you know, f you know, fall directly out of the sky from heaven. Um, no, they had to be discerned. And so if the church isn't infallible, the church isn't, doesn't have that divine authority. If, it, if it's just a group of fallible people and it's not in any way infallible, um, how can a fallible church or a church without infallible authority produce, cause something, namely the Bible, that is infallible, that is infallibly uh, relied upon. How do you get something that's fallible, or rather something that's infallible out of something that's fallible? Um, how can you get something greater out of something that's less? It doesn't make sense. If you can't give what you don't have, the Bible is infallible. You need to have an infallible that is a flawless church it, uh, in order to discern it. Um, the Bible has divine authority. You have to have something with divine authority, namely a church endowed with divine authority in order to say this is what's divinely inspired as opposed to what's not. You have to forgive the, uh, the blowers outside, but that's neither here nor there. 
All right, so I think I hit pretty much my main point um, on the canon of scripture. I think it's a very, very powerful argument for the Catholic Church. And, oh, oh, I remember this. Yeah, one of the great, um, a conversation I had with a non, non-Catholic in the airport once. I was explaining these, um, these councils and stuff. And I, I asked this lady, I said, why can we rely infallibly on the decision of these bishops with what belongs in the New Testament? Um, you know, there's 27 books, not 28, 26, 27 books. Why can we rely infallibly on the decision of those Catholic bishops and Catholic popes? Why can we rely on their decision on the New Testament, but not rely on their decision regards to the Old Testament? How can they get the New Testament right, those 27 books? But the Old Testament, and they include the seven books, how can they get that wrong? It doesn't make any sense. And and we can turn that on us as well. If ever any of us Catholics are struggling with the authority of the church or a teaching of the church, uh, whether it's one of the more hard-hitting you know, sexual morality questions or teachings or whatever, Um, why is it that we can trust in the authority of the church when it comes to the scripture telling us what belongs in the Bible, but not trust in the authority of the church when it comes to some of these other, perhaps more difficult or moral teachings? All right, so even though there are Judases in the College of Apostles, it doesn't mean that Christ made a mistake in establishing the church the way that he did. All right, so I think that's a good place to end. Um, let us pray and thank God for, um, for the canon of Scripture, uh, for knowing what belongs in the Bible, for giving us uh, an authoritative church in order to uh, decide these things and to, and to guide us uh, all the way to salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless.